Chapter 18. Mukwa's Wigwam. How long will we be staying at the fort? Pierre asked Charbonneau the next morning. After complaining about too many questions before breakfast, Charbonneau explained that their layover would last a week. <clears throat> he told Pierre the crew would reassemble less McKay and several others who were taking the trade goods north. The Montreal canoes would bring bale furs back to Lachine, while the north canoes headed into the wilderness. During his vacation from paddling, Pierre wandered through the fort and encampment. Though he ran an occasional errand for Charbonneau or La Petite, he had a lot of free time. Mainly, he listened to the old-timers and learned as, as much as he could about the century-old trading system of the Northwest Territory. One afternoon, Pierre was helping La Petite sort through a lo load of trade goods. The big fellow tossed him one of the famous Northwest trading muskets to put on the gun rack. Be careful, La Petite cautioned. You're holding 20-plus in your hands. Pierre looked at the brass side plate of the gun with its familiar etched dragon and shook his head. How can you keep track of all those pluses? Why, it's simple, lad, McKay answered. They're trading credits. One plus equals one prime beaver pelt. All our company men use the same formula. As each season begins, they give the Indian trappers credits based on the value of a prime beaver pelt. <clears throat> a butcher knife is worth one plus. A woolen blanket is... 8, a Northwest gun, 20, and other things like kettles, hatchets, ironworks, cloths, and needles all have their own value. You give the Indian trade goods before they even bring in furs? Aye, McKay responded. It's all based on trust. I've seen some cheating done, but the whites mainly author it. If you give an Ojibwe a rifle in the fall, you can count on 20 pelts come spring. But what about other furs? Pierre asked. If a prime beaver hide is one plus, a silver fox or a good bear hide can be worth three or even four plus. Some are worth a lot less. It might take eight muskrat hides to equal a single plus. It all depends. Even the grade of beaver can vary. The finest we, we call winter greased beaver. It's caught in cold weather when the pelt is prime. Then it's worn by the Indians until the long hairs fall out, leaving it velvet soft. Why so much interest in the trade? McKay inquired. Are you thinking of wintering with us some season? Me? In an outpost? Pierre reddened at the thought of becoming a hivernet. Aye! And if you don't like the bulwark, tend to your studies. We need a lot of smart fellows to keep track of the money that pours in and out of the frontier. McKay turned away. Pierre felt proud that his commander thought him smart enough to work as a clerk some day. When he considered the weight of a quill pen compared to a paddle... Maybe schooling made sense after all. The trade item that McKay didn't mention was the one that caused the most trouble. Rum. On only his second afternoon at the fort, Pierre watched as two fellows who had been drinking got into an argument over a woman just outside the stockade. It looked like an innocent squabble until one of the men pulled out a knife and jabbed it into his rival's kneecap. The wounded man stabbed the other fellow twice in the chest. The speed of it was dumbfounding. The braves were standing in the sun talking, and an instant later one was bleeding to death in the dust. With the help of his friends, the man with the gashed knee limped home, while the other was carried to the dispensary to die. Later that day, the brother of the dead man, a boy of only ten, went to the house of the man who'd killed his brother. He pushed the muzzle of a northwest gun through the doorway and pulled the trigger. There were two funerals the next day. Pierre got a glimpse of one of them, when he and Charbonneau were walking to Mukwa's for dinner. Charbonneau paused in front of a crowded wigwam. Through the doorway, Pierre saw a number of Ojibwe, both male and female, clustered around the corpse. They were drinking and crying. One man sat at the feet of the corpse, staring into space, while a woman knelt at the head of the body and sobbed, pouring liquor down the dead man's throat. "'What are they doing?' Pierre whispered. "'I'm not sure.' Charbonneau shook his head. Maybe they think the dead are just as fond of rum as the living? They walked on. Pierre asked how he'd met Makwa. Charbonneau chuckled. That's a strange one. I found him one winter near an outpost up on Lake Vermilion about 19 or 20 years back. Charbonneau paused. He was just a boy, lying half dead in the snow. A Sioux war party had killed his entire family. Though Mukwa had a musket ball in his shoulder and another in his leg, he crawled across some thin creek ice and escaped. 
I built a fire to thaw him out and hauled him home on my dog sled. After I dug the lead out with a skinning knife, I waited, waited for him to die, but he toughed it out. Following the custom of his people, he's been forever grateful. When they arrived at Mukwa's wigwam, Pierre was impressed by the quiet order. His wife, three children, and aged mother all greeted the visitors with polite nods, but they left the talking to the chief. The meal was superb. The courses included roast venison, wild rice flavored with maple sugar, smoked trout, and a delicious stewed meat served in laced vessels molded out of white birch, white birch bark. As much as Pierre enjoyed the food, he couldn't help admiring Mukwa's oldest daughter, Kaniwa, who passed dishes to the guest. Pierre expected the whole family to be dressed in gaudy clothing, like their father, but Kaniwa wore a simple white doeskin dress. Her eyes were deep brown and soft. Kaniwa's gentle and quiet manner reminded Pierre of Celeste. It had been six weeks since he'd talked to a person his own age. There were a hundred questions he wanted to ask. But the boldest thing he brought himself to offer was a smile. A baby, who was about the same age as Pierre's little sister Claire, sat across from him during the meal. Whenever Pierre winked at the child, he grinned broadly. Kiwatan has found a friend, Mukwa com commented, proud that his guest paid attention to his young son. Charbonneau and Mukwa spent the evening talking about old times. Milan's name came up more than once. It was clear he'd been a good friend to them both. Pierre listened quietly, but when Mukwa called Lalande snakebite, Pierre asked why. Charbonneau grinned. He was deathly afraid of snakes. It's funny, too, because none of us ever knew it until he went on a scouting trip down the Red River one spring. Mukwa was our guide. We were checking out the training possibilities, and things were going along fine until we camped on a feeder stream of the Red one night. It was a low, boggy area, but we couldn't afford to be choosy since it was getting dark. We'd no sooner pitched our tent and crawled under our blankets when the lawn let out a yelp and jumped up. The snake had tried to crawl up his legs. We all laughed. It was just a harmless water snake, but the lawn was so riled up he nearly pulled the tent down. To calm him, we lit a tallow candle and searched the bedding, although we found three or four of the little rascals. Pierre shuddered at the thought. We threw the snakes out the door, tied the flap down tight, and got Lalan settled in. Everything would have been fine if Mukwa weren't Mukwa here hadn't played the funny man and given Lalan big Lalan's big toe a hard pinch. Poor fellow jumped up again, yelping, I'm bit! I'm snake bit. There's nothing to worry about, Lalan, Mukwa said. Them's just water snakes living in those old graves down by the river. After that comment, Charbonneau shook his head and grinned. He was too spooked to even think about sleeping. Poor pe fellow sat up the rest of the night staring at the tent flap with his blanket wrapped around him, muttering snakes in graves. He caught up on his sleep the next day, Makwa added. Lalan could take a uh, passable nap in the saddle, Charbonneau said, chuckling. He only fell off his horse twice all day. But that's what ended up saving our skins at the end of it all, Makwa said. Charbonneau nodded. He and Mukwa sat in silence a moment, pondering something that had happened long ago, but the talking was done. A short while later, Charbonneau and Pierre thanked Mukwa for his hospitality. Mukwa gave Charbonneau a hug, and Pierre bowed politely to both the chief and his family. On the way back to the fort, Pierre's curiosity got the best of him. What did Mukwa mean by Lalonde saved, saving your skins? he asked. Charbonneau didn't answer right away. He began with a sigh. The next day we were coming up on a ridge when Lalande, who's been snoring for at least a mile, tumbled off his horse. Mukwa and I dismounted to help him when we heard some commotion just ahead. We tethered our horses and belly crawled up a hill. Below us was a Sioux war party marching south. A string of ponies stretched around the ridge and clear out of sight. The faces of the warriors were splattered with grime and blood. Scalp poles were slung over their shoulders. A long, blonde cascade of hair dangling from one pole, and we were close enough to see a pearl comb stick, still stuck in place. It turned your stomach. He took a deep breath. But the worst was the three little golden locks of hair on the next pole. Before we knew it, Lalonde cocked his northwest gun and drew a bead on a Sioux. It would have been suicide, but I thought he was going to fire. 
After the last warrior passed, Lalon still lay there, his gun cocked, sitting on the horizon. There were tears running down his cheeks. Pierre was still thinking of Lalonde when Charbonneau changed the subject. Charbonneau whispered, Look, and pointed towards the waning moon. Below its slender arc, star flecks superior stretched farther than Pierre could see. At that moment, as they stood alone in the silvery dark above the fort, Pierre remembered that he was halfway home.